Good morning. Welcome to Campbelltown Free Church. We're delighted that you're able to join us, whether you're one of our congregation here in Kintyre or a visitor watching us from your own home. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and our King. Although the government allows us to meet again in our building, we still need to put a number of measures in place before that can happen. So we will have to wait a little longer before we can be back together physically in this place. In 1 John 1 verse 3, the Bible reminds us that our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, Christian fellowship is not primarily based on something physical, us being together in a building, but Christian fellowship is first and foremost based on something spiritual, us meeting with God. So even though we still have to worship online, we really are meeting together because we all share in the fellowship of our triune God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let us worship God together. Let us sing to his praise, verses seven to 11 of Psalm 16. I'll praise the Lord, my God, whose counsel guides my choice, and even in the night, my heart recalls instructions voice. We're going to sing this part of Psalm 16 to the tune, the old 134th. And we again thank St. Peter's Free Church in Dundee for sharing the music with us. so full of grace and mercy, love and compassion. We are sinful and self-centered, rebellious and independent. Yet you have sent Jesus, your one and only Son, to be our Saviour. We thank you that he came as the last Adam in a full and perfect humanity to do what we could not do. He has perfectly fulfilled the law for us and he has died in our place in order to redeem us from the curse of the law. Through our solidarity with Adam in his sin, we were spiritually dead, 
and heading for eternal condemnation and destruction. But as a result of our union with Jesus, we are now made alive eternally. As by Adam sin entered the world and death by sin, so in Jesus we have received grace, forgiveness, righteousness and eternal life. Our guilt was transferred to Jesus and he made atonement for it. And more than that, his perfect righteousness was transferred to us and we were rewarded for it. We stand unafraid before you, a holy God, whose eyes are too pure to look on evil, a holy God who cannot stand the sight of wrong. We stand unafraid before you because we are clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Our God and our Father, no words we can ever say can adequately express our amazement and our thankfulness for such a great salvation. And yet, our God and Father, we still sin, not living as those who are under the reign of grace, but living as if we were still under the control of sin. We give in to temptation so easily, refusing to utilize the help Jesus offers to us. We hanker after our old way of life, at times foolishly imagining that it is better than our new life in Jesus. We substitute activity and busyness for intimacy with you, and so there is a coldness in our hearts towards Jesus. We are not as sensitive towards sin as we should be, and so we become careless about our relationship with you. There's a hardness towards Jesus which is seen in our disobedience to his word. Old patterns of self-sufficient independence rear their ugly heads as we rely on our own abilities and not on your spirit's strength. What great sinners we are. We, we wonder at how you put up with us. Yet we thank you for your patience with us and your determination to complete the good work that you have begun in us. How we bless you for your promise. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And so we rest upon that promise that you have given to us, a promise underwritten by Jesus' death on the cross. And we ask that for Jesus' sake, you would do as you said you would do, and that you would forgive us, and you would cover our sin and turn aside from your displeasure. Our God and our Father, in this time of worship, come near and strengthen us, that Jesus might reign supreme in our hearts, in every thought, word, and action. Graciously work within us a faith that purifies the heart, that overcomes the world, that motivates acts of love, that fastens us to you, and that always clings to the cross. And we ask this as we always do, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to read again, read from the um, Old Testament section of the Bible. We're going to read the end part of Isaiah 53, uh, a passage that speaks about Jesus, especially his death, but also his resurrection. We're going to read from verses 7 to the end of the chapter. Isaiah 53, verses 7 to 12. He was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and pro prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After the suffering of the soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession 
for the transgressors. Amen. Let's pray again. Good and gracious God, in your mercy you have brought us to a place that has created the conditions for a significant easing of lockdown. Yet while we thank you for all your undeserved kindness towards us as individuals and as a nation, we confess that we are still afraid of what might happen in the future and how the new environment in which we find ourselves will work out. You are the only dependable refuge in times of insecurity. So help us to continue to place all our trust in you and in you alone. Good and gracious God, give your ongoing protection and help to all who work in the NHS and in care homes so that they might have the physical stamina, the emotional strength and the medical compassion to keep on serving you by serving our community. Give your patience to those who are still shielding at home from the virus. Give your healing to those who are still suffering the physical and mental impact of the virus. Give your comfort to those who are still grieving over the death of a family member or a friend from the virus. Give your guidance to our leaders at all levels of government, society and the church as they seek to help us make our way out of lockdown. Give your love and concern for the well-being of others to us all so that we will not act or speak in a way that endangers them. Give your peace and encouragement to those who are anxious and fearful about what the days ahead might bring in terms of education and work. Good and gracious God, as we move cautiously into the new normal, may it not be characterised by us turning away from you and turning away from the good, righteous, life-bringing, wholesome and trustworthy standards of the Bible. Instead, may you turn again to us, showing us your favour, forgiving our disobedience to you, dealing with our failures and setting aside your displeasure. Grant us your peace so that we might be part of a nation in which love, truth, faithfulness and righteousness coexist in such strong harmony that all forms of hatred, lies, self-centeredness and deviant behaviour are banished. Our good and gracious God, we bring you our thanks for what you have done so far in our lives as individuals and as a nation. And we trust in you in the present as well to lead us and guide us. And we look to you for the future. Bless us and lead us in your ways. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. We're going to uh, sing again. Uh, it's the hymn, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. A prayer that, as we turn to God's word, ask God to come and speak to us. And once again, we thank St. Peter's Free Church in Dundee for sharing this music with us.
We're going to read again from the Bible, God's Word, this time from the New Testament section of that uh, the Bible, uh, Acts chapter 3, and we're going to read the first uh, 16 verses, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. But before we read this passage and think about what it's saying to us, let's pray and ask God for God's help. Let's pray together. Holy Lord, the one who sits enthroned as King forever, by your Holy Spirit, speak your powerful and majestic word to us. Give us my minds uh, that understand the knowledge of your glory as it is displayed in Jesus, your Son. Bend our wills to submit to what you have, have to say to us so that we might experience the peace of your salvation and not the terror of your judgment. And we ask this for the sake of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk taking him by the right hand he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong he jumped to his feet and began to walk then he went with them into the temple courts walking and jumping and praising god when all the people saw him walking and praising god they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called beautiful they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see um, and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Amen. On the occasions when I have to telephone my bank to speak to them about my account and when I eventually get to speak to a person as opposed to a machine, uh, the first question the customer service advisor usually asks me is, what is my name? And then I'm asked a whole raft of follow-up questions that are designed to check that I am who I say that I am. And it's only when this validation pro procedure is over that my bank is able to uh, process my inquiry. Over the past seven weeks, we've been uh, looking at some of the events of the last 24 hours of Jesus' life under the general heading, Jesus 24. Last week, we reached the destination that all the events surrounding Jesus' arrest and trials were taking us, and that is to Jesus' death by crucifixion on the hill of the skull. Although his death is the climax of the Jesus story, it's not the conclusion of the Jesus story. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all record, record how Jesus was raised from the dead. So in a sense, in order to bring the Jesus 24 to its proper conclusion, I want us to look today at Jesus' resurrection. But since these events took place uh, three days after Jesus' death by the Jewish method of counting at that time, I can't really call it Jesus 24. So it's Jesus 24 plus. Jesus makes some staggering claims about himself. And yet his death seemed to suggest that all these claims amounted to nothing but a pack of lies, that they were bogus, they were false. And what I want us to do today is to think about how Jesus' resurrection validated them, that he really was who he said he was. And in order to see how his resurrection validates Jesus' claims, I want to take us to an incident that happened probably about two months after Jesus' death and resurrection. It's recorded for us by Luke in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John were heading into the temple through the beautiful gate when a beggar asked them for some money. And this man was well known, probably because he'd been begging in the same spot for several years but that day he didn't get any change but he was changed because Peter healed him and, and news about what had happened spread like wildfire through the temple complex and a large crowd soon gathered and Peter began to preach to them and surprisingly the focus of what Peter said was not on just what had happened but on Jesus' resurrection, to which the healing of this disabled man pointed. And in the course of his sermon, Peter makes three points about Jesus. They're found in Acts 3, verse 15. You killed him. God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses to this. Uh, and what I want us to do this morning is to use Peter's three points as a framework to see how Jesus' resurrection validates his claim to be who he says he is. So the first point of Peter's sermon uh, is this, you killed him. Uh, and this zeroes in on the rejection of Jesus' claims, the rejection of Jesus' claims. Here is a large crowd gobsmacked at the healing that had just taken place. They, they've never come across anything like this in their life. And what does Peter do? Instead of focusing in on what he had just done to the beggar a few moments ago, Peter instead focuses in on what they had done to Jesus a few months ago. You killed him. And in that statement, we have compressed together all the various forms of rejection Jesus experienced uh, in his death. For starters, Jesus had been condemned to die by the Jewish religious authorities as a blasphemer. You remember that during his civil trial before the Sanhedrin, in one last desperate attempt to get some sort of charge to stick, Caiaphas, uh, the high priest, had binned any pretense of legality and asked Jesus point blank whether or not he was the Christ, the son of the blessed one. And Jesus didn't duck the question. He didn't try to sidestep it with some nifty footwork. His answer was direct, I am. But Jesus' reply was also loaded with significance because I am was God's special name. And in replying to Caiaphas' question in the way that he did, Jesus was doing more than answering it in the affirmative. Jesus was claiming to be God himself. He was taking God's name for himself. The Sanhedrin didn't need any lengthy deliberations about whether Jesus was guilty or not. And the high priest spoke for all of them when he said, we, we condemn Jesus to death for blasphemy. So his claim to be God in a real humanity was totally rejected. And then secondly, Jesus 
was also executed by the Romans as a rebel. In Israel's time, uh, Israel was known, or in Jesus' time, Israel was known as Judah, Judea, and uh, part of the sprawling Roman Empire. And the occupying Ro Roman regime reserved the right uh, to execute people to itself. So that's why the Jewish religious leaders had to go to Pilate, the Roman governor, uh, and ask him to carry out the death sentence. Pilate would have had no time for something like blasphemy, which he regarded as uh, in-house Jewish squabbling. So the, the streetwise Jewish uh, authorities accused Jesus of rebellion. Pilate was now paying attention to them because the stability of the region and more importantly to Pilate, his pension was now at stake. And outmaneuvered by the wily Jewish leaders who, who in, whose increasingly strident insistence on Jesus' execution was backed up by the mob in the street chanting for Jesus' blood, Pilate caved in and he handed Jesus over to be crucified as a rebel. His claim to be a king had been totally rejected. And then thirdly, and this is probably the most surprising element in uh, Jesus' rejection. It appeared as if Jesus had been abandoned by God as a sinner. When Mark records Jesus' death, he, he's very stingy in the number of words he uses to describe Jesus' physical death. In, in Greek, it's only three and four in English. He just says, and they crucified him. He's not trying to play down the physical aspect of Jesus' death uh, as if it was not horrific. But that's not the most important aspect of what was happening on the hill of the skull. When it comes to describing Jesus' spiritual sufferings, Mark's word count is anything but economical because he wants along with the other gospel writers, that the emphasis, emphasis should lie there on Jesus' spiritual suffering. Above everything else, Mark is keen to stress that Jesus died exposed to God's judgment, abandoned by God as a sinner. So he underlines the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion, not to send shivers down our spines, uh, because crucifixion was a particularly nasty and unpleasant way to die, but so that we might plug into the Deuteronomy 21 verse 23 statement that anyone who was crucified died under God's judgment and curse. All Mark's talk about darkness enveloping the land as Jesus suffered on the cross it is a throwback to the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. And the plagues were signs of God's judgment. So as Jesus suffers in pitch black darkness he is exposed to God's judgment of the seven statements Jesus made from the cross Mark only records one my God my God why have you forsaken me uh, th this cry of despair is not a sign that Jesus faith had, had collapsed under the strain of the cross rather it's a statement of fact as to what was happening to him as he bore the penalty for our sin, dying in our place for our rebellion against God and our blasphemy at playing at being God, Jesus was abandoned by the Father. The Father turned away from his Son. So, so everything that is happening on the hill of the skull seemed to indicate that Jesus was totally rejected by God as a sinner. And then last but not least in terms of significance, Jesus had been buried by his disciples as a corpse. The, the actual act of burial is often the most difficult part of a funeral because it really is the end. It signals that the person is dead and it tells us that we will never see her again. The final stage of Jesus' rejection was when his corpse was buried in the tomb of a prominent Jewish figure, Joseph of Arimathea. It was the end of the story, the final confirmation of his rejection. You 
killed him. Now, if we were in a cinema watching the story of Jesus uh, as a film, uh, at this point, the closing credits would start to crawl up the screen because laying a corpse to rest is usually the final scene in the story, but not for Jesus. Peter has only preached his first point so as we grab our bits and bobs and head for the door of the cinema, he, he calls us back with another three words. God raised him. And, and this statement zooms in on God's reversal of what Jesus' death and burial seem to be saying about him. Jesus' resurrection was God's ultimate reversal of Jesus. Because by raising him from the dead, God turns on their head the four areas in which Jesus appeared to be rejected and validates Jesus' claim to be exactly who he said he, said he is. So in the first place, the resurrection reversed the whole idea that he was a blasphemer and showed that Jesus really was the Son of God. As he suffered, the Jews taunted Jesus, challenging him to prove that he was the Son of God by, by leaping off the cross. Now, what they realised, did, what they didn't realise was that it was not that Jesus could not come down from the cross, but that he would not come down from the cross. He had to stay on the cross if he was to save us from our sins. So when Jesus didn't do what they wanted, the Jewish religious leaders smiled smugly at each other and went home convinced that this blasphemer had got everything that he deserved. But God raised them from the dead to reverse their verdict on Jesus. Here's how Paul puts it in Romans 1 verse 4. Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus' resurrection validates Jesus' claim to be the Son of God. The so-called blasphemer is shown to be right all along. He is who he says he is, God's Son. And then secondly, the resurrection also reversed the whole idea that he was a rebel and showed Jesus to be the King. The wooden board fastened to Jesus' cross read the King of the Jews. It flagged up that Jesus had been executed for the charge of rebellion, claiming to be a king in opposition to the Roman Emperor. But it was a source of fun for the onlookers because as his mutilated, battered body hung helplessly on the cross, Jesus looked anything but a king. Some king this is! The onlookers jeered. What a joke. But when God raised him from the dead, he reversed their verdict on Jesus. For God raised Jesus from the grave to heaven's throne to reign as the King of Kings. Here's how Paul put it in Philippians 2 verses 8 and 9. Speaking about Jesus, he said, He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of and a consequence of that, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. The resurrection and his subsequent ascension to heaven's throne validates Jesus' claim to be the king. It's true, incontrovertibly true. This so-called rebel has shown that he's been right all along. He is who he says he is, the king. Then the resurrection reversed the whole idea that Jesus was a sinner and showed that Jesus was the saviour of sinners. As he hung on the cross, the jibes came thick and fast and, and they were vicious. He can't save himself. What sort of a saviour is that? What a laugh. Now, now we know that Jesus had informed his disciples that he was going to be killed and that his death would be the means he would save others, securing forgiveness for their sins 
and restoring friendship between God and them. But his disciples completely failed to grasp what Jesus was talking about. If, if even those closest to him could not understand that uh, had he chosen to save himself, Jesus would be no saviour, then there was no chance of his enemies understanding that. All they could see was a sinner dying under God's curse and most definitely not a saviour. But when God raised him from the dead, he reversed his verdict on Jesus. Many of you know, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you that I struggle with number sequences. So I often announce the wrong number for a hymn or the wrong page number for the Bible reading. All the right numbers are there, but I see them in the wrong order. Uh, this means that sometimes buying stuff over the internet can be very challenging for me when I'm asked to enter my 16-digit credit card number and press the confirm button. Sometimes I get a payment decline message. It's not that my credit is bad, I have to say, but it's just that I've keyed in the right numbers, but in the wrong order. So I re-enter the numbers very carefully a second time and press the confirm button again and up pops the payment accepted message. Now on the cross, Jesus made payment for our sin and his resurrection is God's payment accepted message to us. Here's again how Paul puts it, Romans 4 verse 25. Jesus was delivered over to death for our sin and was raised to life for our justification. The resurrection validates Jesus' claim to be incontrovertibly true. The so-called sinner is shown to be right all along. He is who he says he is, not a sinner, but the saviour of sinners. And once again, last but no terms, not least in terms of significance, the resurrection reversed the whole idea that Jesus was a dead corpse and showed that Jesus is the giver of life. Death is final. For when we say goodbye to someone at a burial service, we don't expect to say hello to them again. But that wasn't true in Jesus' case. In Jesus, the natural process of decomposition was reversed and he emerged through death into new resurrection life. When God raised him from the dead, he reversed Jesus' relationship to death. Death couldn't hold him or contain him. Jesus is above death. Here's how put Peter puts it in his sermon in Acts 3, verse 15. You killed the author of life but God raised him from the dead. The resurrection validates Jesus' claim to be incontrovertibly true. The so-called dead corpse is shown to be right all along. He is who he says he is, the giver of life. Now, Peter has one more point to his sermon, and unlike some of mine, his is a short one. He says, you killed him, God raised him, we are witnesses. That state statement focuses on confirmation of the resurrection by eyewitnesses. All this talk about Jesus rising from the dead is not made up once upon a time stuff. We're dealing here with hard-nosed, historical, verifiable facts. Evidence that can be tested and found to be true. Jesus appeared to various individuals and groups of people in a wide variety of settings and at different times of the day. These are not hallucinations. These are real appearances of someone who is very much alive. These post-resurrection appearances of Jesus are important because 
just as Jesus' burial confirmed the historical and physical reality of his death, so these appearances confirmed the physical and, and historical reality of his resurrection. Peter and the other apostles witnessed these appearances. They didn't hear about them from someone else. This wasn't second-hand information or third-hand information. Someone told me that someone told me that someone told me. They saw the risen Jesus with their own eyes. Their testimony would stand up in any court of law and withstand the cr sternest cross-examination because it was not hearsay. We are witnesses of this. And their first-hand testimony confirms that Jesus' resurrection really happened. Jesus' resurrection is so much more than another story of a local boy coming good in the end. It's an open challenge to us all as to how we view Jesus and how we respond to his validated claims as to who he is. The resurrection informs us that Jesus really is God's son. And because he is God, he has the inside track on God, speaking authoritatively as God to us about what God wants us to do. There are many things and many times when Jesus commands rub painfully up against our own desires and instincts or up against the wishes of those close to us. And we're tempted to do what we want and what others want us to do as opposed, as opposed to what Jesus tells us to do. And Jesus' resurrections, re resurrection shouts his credentials at us and to us. He is the Son of God, so we need to take what he says immensely seriously and to do what he says, no matter how inconvenient it might be or how unpopular it might make us. The resurrection informs us that Jesus really is the King and that he is King over all. And this means that he rules over every area of your life and over every area of my life. Our culture tends to view Jesus in the same way as it does cash, not to be flashed about in public. It's fine to believe in Jesus, it tells us, but keep it to yourself. Our, our culture wants us to stick Jesus into our back pocket and not to bring him out until we get into the privacy of our homes or our church. Jesus isn't for the public square. It's the privatization of religion. But folks, the resurrection doesn't give us that option. Jesus was raised from the grave not to stand quietly in some out-of-the-way corner of a church, but he was raised from the grave to rule from the throne of the universe. He is Lord and King over all and everyone, and we must not keep him indoors because he rules over everywhere. And we are to show that he is king and our king, not just in our own private lives, not just in our churches, but in the public square and in the marketplace, because Jesus is king over that as well. And the resurrection informs us that Jesus really does save us from God's curse. Some people think that Jesus just came to be a nice example to us. The 
But that's not what Jesus says why he came. He says, first and foremost, he came to save us from sin and the horrendous consequences of our sin. And by raising him from the dead, God is saying that he has accepted what Jesus achieved on the cross as a payment for sin. And that means that if you put your trust in Jesus, God will forgive you and God will set you free from sin's stranglehold over your life. Those things you would love to be free from, but sometimes you don't really want to be free from them. But he'll set you free from them and he'll be your friend. He'll no longer be against you before you. And the resurrection informs us that that's what Jesus does by his death. He saves us. And the resurrection informs us that Jesus really has the power to give us eternal life when we die. We came to Campbelltown nearly three years ago and uh, one of the crucial moments in our flip from Belfast to Campbelltown was when we got the key to the manse. We were able to move in. Through his resurrection, Jesus is dangling a bunch of keys in front of us. They are the keys to eternal life. And all life is his because he is the giver of life, or as Peter put it, the author of life. And if you want to experience eternal life, then Jesus is the person you need to see for who he is, the only one who has the keys to eternal life. I am the resurrection and the life he announced. Anyone who believes in me will live after dying. Jesus' resurrection validates who he is. It validates his claim to be the Son of God, the King, the Saviour of sinners, and the giver of life. Do you see that? You look at the evidence in front of you, it's clear. Do you see that? That Jesus is who he says he is? Do you believe that? And have you placed your trust in him alone that he might save you and give you eternal life? Let's pray for a moment. Glorious Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the activity of your Holy Spirit, you raised Jesus from the dead to your throne, definitively declaring him to be who he claims he is, the Son of God, the King, the Saviour of sinners, and the giver of life. What certainty, what joy, what hope, and what assurance Jesus' resurrection brings to us. And we praise you with all of our being for your unsurpassing greatness and your acts of power. Glorious Father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the activity of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we might experience your incomparably great power. May the mighty strength which you exerted when you raised Jesus from the dead, may it flow in us and through us so that we might put our trust in Jesus alone and be able to live for Jesus and become more like Jesus and serve Jesus and make Jesus known. Accept our praise and hear our prayer because we come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Saviour and our risen Lord. Amen. We're going to finish off our service by singing a hymn about Jesus' resurrection. See what a morning gloriously bright. Oh,
shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 